I'm so nervous if you if you're gonna like it or not. If I don't like it, you're out of here. You're done. Cheers. Cheers. Whoa. Okay. Do you like it? It's like Lacroix's older sister. Yes. Packs more of a flavor punch. A more of a flavor punch, but it's not like soda. But also, we'll get into this. You studied abroad in Edinburgh. I did. Or you studied in Edinburgh. Yes. And I studied abroad in Edinburgh. Oh right, of course. So I, was, I forgot about that actually. I was gonna get you some whiskey, some scotch, but uh, I figured it was a little too early. Just a little. But you like, could have done it though. Maybe after I would have been down. Today I am joined by my friend Grace Wells. Grace is a successful content creator and filmmaker who's been making waves on TikTok and beyond. She first gained global attention in 2020 with her witting and engaging TikTok videos, which were mock commercials for random products like a spoon or an egg, aka her series, Epic Commercials for Random Objects. Grace's signature style is her knack for creating funny, relatable, and creative commercials while also showing the behind the scenes of how they were made. Now with over 3.4 million followers across social, she has has been hired by brands like Maybelline, Old Spice, Celsius, Amazon Prime Video, The Weather Channel, and many others to direct, produce, and edit commercials. She's since been signed as a commercial director, and if you don't work in the film industry or advertising, that is a huge, huge deal. She casually won the 2023 Content Creator of the Year at the Influencer Marketing Awards. Grace, how are you feeling today? Great. Very excited. I just moved to New York City like three days ago. Um, and it's been like a very long time yeah. coming. Yeah. So I'm really, really excited to be here. And yeah. I feel like it's just like the start of a new chapter for me. So yes, yeah. I'm so excited for you. You're in Brooklyn. Um, why did you pick Brooklyn? I grew up kind of like in the suburbs slash upstate. Okay. And I just wanted something that was a little bit more like chill. I've never been like a super hardcore Manhattan girly. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just trying to find something that was like a little bit more residential, but still close. And yeah. like, I love the park and yeah. you know, so yeah. That's Yay. Okay, great. I lived in Brooklyn for three years and I loved it. And I'm just across the border now in Queens. Yeah. So we can, Brooklyn's right there. We can probably see your apartment if we get some binoculars. <laughs> Um, how was the moving process? Did you move yourself or did you hire a company? I hired a company okay. and thank goodness. Cause I, it wasn't even, I have like no personal belongings, but I have <laughs> so much like equipment. Gear. From, yeah, yeah. Gear and backdrops and like all this stuff. And it's like, <laughs> It's, it's even more than you think it is once you put it into boxes. You're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I definitely needed a hand with that. Moving is always so stressful. And I'm so impressed that you were still able to make it to this interview today after like moving. I out. wouldn't miss it. I would have been like dead for like a week. <laughs> okay. So first of all, um, this is something I ask all my guests to just make sure that they're qualified to be on the show. Mm -hmm. um, and that question is, do you know what you're doing? Not at all. You passed. Excellent. You're qualified to be on the show. <laughs> It'd be awkward if I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd be like, Absolutely. get out. <laughs> get out of here. I'm going to do a little rapid fire question round. Okay. Um, so that we can get to know you and find out, you know, where you came from in your background. Okay. First question. Where did you grow up? In New York. In up upstate New York. We need the full address, your social security number. Absolutely. Number. I'm from Westchester County, which people... I, it's not really upstate, but I just call it upstate because people in the city, it's either like the city or it's upstate. Yeah. Um, so it's very much just like New York City suburbia. Okay. Um, and I don't know. It, it's, um, it's a very like insular kind of place to grow up. Okay. Not a lot of diversity. It's like living in the suburbs. I grew it's up in like the suburbs It's like fine. Yeah. Yeah. It just is what it is. Um, okay. What did your parent or parents do for a living growing up? My father was always a stay-at-home dad, which was cute. Cute. Yeah. And my mom was a magazine editor. Casual. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Um, did you go to college? And if so, what did you study? I did. I went to the University of Edinburgh and I studied linguistics. What was your first job? My first ever job was I worked at a, a drugstore <laughs> as like a sales clerk and I, but I do count that because I feel like I learned a lot totally there, to be that. honest. Like, and I was there for quite a few years. I was there all throughout high school and then some of college too. So that's kind of like random. Like, did you yeah. just walk in? You're like, I could work here. Yeah. <laughs> it was just basically like one of the only, cause it was like such a small town. It was like one of the only places in my town that was hiring like young kids. So yeah. we were all just like, okay, we're going to come go. kids. Sell yeah. the drugs. <laughs> right. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, what is your current job? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> I would, I mean, I guess I would just blanket call myself a video content creator, but there's just so many like 
facets to what that even means. So yeah. Yeah. You're, you're like a one woman agency. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. In a way I am. Um, like I, I, I wear a lot of hats as I'm sure you do yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. Let's get back to you going to school in Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. So like you did not decide to go to some state school. You were like, peace out America. I'm going to Scotland. Yes. Why? So my, um, my mom was born in England. Mm-hmm. So I have kind of been back and forth. Not like it's not, I never lived there or anything, but, um, I was kind of back and forth like a couple times a year growing up. Um, and so it was always just kind of like on my radar as like, a place that is far, but not like terribly, terribly different from here. Like, you know, yeah. obviously it is, it is different, but it's also not. Um, so when I was applying to schools, I was like, okay, I want to go somewhere like yeah. really far away. Yeah. Um, so I only applied to schools in California and the UK. Okay. And I got into a couple in both. I actually originally ended up going to St. Andrews in the UK. Oh, okay. yeah. I was there for one semester and I hated it. Okay. Um, I'm also a transfer baby. So it's a gorgeous, gorgeous town. But I feel like that was really the only reason I initially went there was because I was so awestruck by just how beautiful it was. Yeah. And then when I got there, I realized a couple of things. One, I realized that if you go to a school that was built in the 1400s, <laughs> you're like, you're in these dorms, like there's no <laughs> heat there's no plumbing yeah. it is like, <laughs> like you're just living in like medieval times <laughs> like just craving like the, like I, that sounds dramatic but like it's just it was just like a very um like uncomfortable yeah it was like kind yeah. of uncomfortable to to be in that and also I just wasn't thrilled with the curriculum yeah. um because it is such a small school there's not a whole lot of options of like really fun interesting classes that you could take it's all very just like straightforward bare bones like I, I enjoyed the people that I met and it was like a a good time but after the one semester I was like okay I'm I'm over it now yeah so when I initially went to St. Andrews I went for French and Spanish um and I discovered that I didn't I I love foreign language but what I love about it is more of the mechanics okay and that French and Spanish course it was very much like we're gonna read medieval French poetry and analyze the literature and like it was very much like literature based so I was like what can I do that's more like what I'm actually interested in, which is like the actual mechanics of learning. Yeah. Um, and that's how I found linguistics. And I noticed that Edinburgh, which is very close to St. Andrews, had a, like one of the best linguistics programs in the world. Wow. Um, so I was like, that's really convenient because it's super close to where I am now, but, and like in a bigger city, maybe more of a fun vibe. Yeah. Um, more plumbing <laughs> and <laughs> better plumbing, better plumbing. We got, <laughs> and, um, we got blankets, we got pillows. Yeah. Yeah. And more of what I want to learn. So. Oh, great. Okay. So I'm curious, like when you graduated high school, what did you think you wanted to do with your life? Essentially? I didn't, know exactly what I wanted to do I just knew that I was like always very fascinated by learning languages Mm -hmm. so I was like kind of dropping all of the classes that I could like I did not take physics I did not take calculus I was like I'm gonna take French and Spanish and Latin like I've like and my school didn't offer a ton of language classes because it was very small but I was like I want to take all the languages that I can um I was maybe somewhat interested in some sort of like curriculum creation okay um because I was very passionate about the fact that I don't think that the way language learning is taught in American schools is efficient cool. at all okay um and I was always so jealous of you know people who live in Europe and who yeah. kind of grow up speaking multiple languages yeah. and it it's very effortless for them mm-hmm. and I felt like in in the U.S. my experience learning languages it's like up until the 10th grade it was all just like we're gonna have taco day today yeah. like, you know it was like there wasn't a whole oh, lot of terrible. like actual learning and it was happening. all like conjugations and like just l- not learning yeah. things through yeah we were never really like actually no conversing with no. one another or never. anything um so yeah that was kind of like my initial I don't know exactly what this job is but like I would love to be in some sort of like curriculum policy creation role where yeah. I'm like helping change yeah. the way that language is taught in schools. Cool. Okay. So that's very much not what I'm doing right now. So different. <laughs> so like one of the reasons why I think you're so interesting is because you went to this great university for this very specific thing and then you made a left turn and yes. you went to something completely different. So I, I oftentimes have people reach out to me and they say, hey, Aaron, I went to school for this thing. I invested all this money, but I'm thinking I actually don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. But they feel like they already spent money on it and time and their life. And it's kind of like almost embarrassing to say like, oh, I picked the wrong major. 
What would you say to people who feel like that? I would say that I feel, and maybe this is just the circle that I'm in, but I feel like most of the people that I know did not end up doing the thing that they studied. And I think that a lot of the time when we go to college, what we're actually learning is not necessarily the, the you know, that knowledge and information. It's a lot more of like time management skills and yeah. like self-discipline yeah. and these kind of like more abstract, um, just like, coping mechanisms for like existing in the world that's true but the but the knowledge even if you do end up you know following a a career that's um reflective of your degree you're still going to be learning on the job from you know like it's not like you're going to go into that job knowing exactly what to do anyway such a good point like people don't understand like industries are always changing and there's no way that college can possibly keep up with them I mean the film and my film degree was like way behind (laughs) like yeah I popped into the industry and I was like wait they're not even using the same systems anymore Mm -hmm. um so that's actually a really good point what would you say about like I don't know more of like the psychological implications of switching and I don't know. It seemed like it was really easy for you to like just go into film after you graduated. Um, when I got to around junior year, I had kind of had this sort of period of disillusionment where I was like, I'm studying this thing. I do think it's interesting, but I yeah. don't really know where I'm going with this or what I want to do or what I want my job to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I had kind of reached that conclusion where it was like, I feel like I'm only here for a piece of paper mm-hmm. and not really for knowledge that I'm actually going to be applying later in life. Okay. So I kind of already come to terms with that s- sort of concept. Mm-hmm. Um, so that by the time I discovered, in a sense, photography and video, I was already kind of divested yeah. Yeah. from my... Man, my, I would stop doing my homework. I'd yeah. be like, I'm out of this. It was hard yeah. <laughs> for me yeah. to like k- keep yeah. being motivated to finish my degree. But at that point, it was like, okay, I'm so close to yeah. finishing this degree. Like, I just have to finish. Oh, that's so funny. There are so many other questions that I want to ask you, but I have to stay on track because we have so much to learn from you. Tell us about how you first started doing TikTok and like how that all went down. Like it's March, 2020 mm-hmm. COVID's hitting. You got to come back to the U S like what's going on. So yeah, I, at that point at, at that time when COVID had hit, I had been sort of taking photos and some videos as a hobby for maybe like six months. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just very much something that was like a fun creative outlet. I wasn't pursuing it as a career. It was just kind of like, I don't really love school right now. I need something else to do that's fun. Yeah. So that's what photo and video was for me at that point. Um, And then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, for the University of Edinburgh, like they had no online infrastructure whatsoever. There was not a single like, oh, you can go to this platform to learn this online. Like there was nothing. So it was basically like once COVID hit, like (laughs) you're you're done. Like that's it. Like congrats you passed you graduated really? yeah they like, just gave you like a's and stuff like yeah for we had um we did have to write a dissertation which we had had to hand in obviously because okay. at that point it was basically almost done yeah. um but all of the classes that we were taking at that point they were just like there's no final like you you're good like congrats oh my gosh. yeah so it was like that was wild. wild so um yeah like I had sort of you know everything been building up to like finals and all this stuff and like then all of a sudden I was like okay well I guess all my plans are canceled now. Um, so I was, I stayed in Edinburgh until September of 2020. Oh, wow. I, I, yeah. Cause at that point, um, I had already planned, I was like, Oh, I'm going to stay for the fringe festival. Oh, you gotta stay for I the was fringe. like, we're going to stay. Yeah. That didn't happen. Oh, of course. <laughs> um, so I was holed up in my little apartment. The windows didn't open. We couldn't go outside. They were very strict by the way. Like wow. they, it was like very much like they would find you if they saw you <gasps> walking on the side of the road. Yeah. Here it was like a little like that too, but they wouldn't find you. That's yeah. Insane. They would check your groceries. They would check your grocery bags. And if you just had like a bottle of wine and a loaf of bread, they'd be like, this is not an essential. You're like, excuse trip. me. <laughs> It absolutely You're is like, essential. I would argue, actually. Actually, <laughs> these we're are, in a pandemic. These are the two most essential things. <laughs> I live off of bread yeah. and wine. Are you kidding me? If you were in France, they wouldn't say anything. Exactly. It's just the UK. It's very true. Like, get your potatoes <laughs> and your water <laughs> or your beer. Yeah, your cod. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I had heard a little bit about TikTok in the months leading up to that. It hadn't really fully blown up yet. Yeah. Um, but because I worked at a restaurant, a lot of my coworkers were like, my age or younger. So there was kind of like, um, yeah, whispers of like this app. Same. At that time I had been, I had a YouTube channel. So I'd had a couple of like, 
and with like 80 like 80 subscribers like I I was not like I was like a YouTuber (laughs) like I was just kind of like it was like my friends followed me basically (laughs) um subscribed so I was like okay I'm just gonna like take a couple of clips from my YouTube videos and start posting them on TikTok um and sort of over time I started to realize that they were performing better on TikTok than they were on YouTube. Um, cause that was kind of that moment where like the discoverability on TikTok was super, super At high. Max. Yeah. Yeah. So I started experimenting more and I eventually for some reason decided one day that I was going to make a commercial for a fork. Um, it was the most random idea. It was the most random idea ever. It was not really supposed to be a series initially, but it was just kind of like, I'm stuck at home. I have nothing to do. I have this camera. I can't work w- with models, which yeah. is what I had been doing up until that point. Okay. Um, like what can I make by myself? Like I can make a branded content. I can make a commercial. Yeah. Fork. What, what do I make it for? Obviously. I'm just going to just pick a random thing to make it for. Yeah. Cause why not? Fork. Um, why not spoon or knife or spork? It's, it's a really good question. Maybe my life would have gone in a very different direction I had I chosen that. another Look into your silverware bias. Of, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so I made this, again, it was just practicing using my camera. I made this commercial for a fork. I posted a longer version of that video on YouTube. I took a little clip of it, posted it on TikTok, and it got like 30,000 views in like an hour. Wow. Which was insane mental yeah. like still mental yeah. like now so okay I guess I'm just gonna do more of this and slowly over time it became it became a series so yeah. epic commercials oh my god! epic gosh. commercials random objects I love them all I mean the egg the classic egg yeah. is like still my favorite um okay so you started posting TikToks what was the first one that like really blew up I mean it was the it was the fork one which okay. is crazy. I had a, I had maybe one or two videos that I posted before that that didn't that were like fine whatever maybe a couple hundred or a couple thousand views mm-hmm. probably a couple hundred views. <laughs> <laughs> and but then once I hit the that fork video that hit like 2 million wow. in one week. Wow. Um so yeah, it it all just sort of like yeah. from there. And how did you feel seeing that 2 million? I had an anxiety attack. I like, (laughs) like seriously, I had always kind of like had, um, daydreams of like, Oh, one day I'm going to log into YouTube and like my, my video is going to have all these views and like, I'll, I'll make it like, you know, um, that'll be the day. Yeah. That'll be the day. And, and then it happened on TikTok, and I was like, can I say that? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this feels so different and this feels so much scarier than I thought it would because these are people, these are real people who are watching what I'm doing, who have opinions about what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Some of them nice, some of them not so nice. Um, and yeah, that kind of wide scale exposure yeah. so suddenly with yeah. no context yeah is very overwhelming. Mm-hmm. I agree. And you've talked about like social anxiety in the past, which I love how like transparent you are about this stuff. It's just so refreshing to see a creator who's both very successful and organized and capable. And you're just like a professional and you know, your shit, but you're also like, Hey, I deal with social anxiety. So how do you deal with, I get that feeling too. It's like people are watching me mm-hmm. and then you do get those comments every now and then we're like, Oh, that was like, kind of offensive or like that you know made me feel some type of way how are you dealing with comments like bad comments maybe this isn't so great but it's just like over time you grow a thicker skin and like the more that you the more that you see the less it affects you um there's still some things that affect me I would say that for me um when people critique my work like that's I'm totally fine with that like go ahead if you have criticism about what I'm doing it's more like if you're attacking me as a human as an individual like that's when I'm like yeah ouch yeah (laughs) um so yeah it's hard but I I find something that's helped me cope a little bit though has been noticing um like contradictions in my comments in the sense that like one person will say I hated this thing about your video. And then another person will say, I loved this thing about your video. And it's like, okay, well. It's not a me problem. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> people are different and everything is subjective. Oh and, my gosh, yeah. Um, just kind of seeing how, you know, everyone has a totally different opinion about the same thing has kind of helped me not take any one person's, um, you know, 
hatred. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious um, with you because you like went to school for something just not film related and then you never really had like production experiences. You went right into your own company. Do you ever feel imposter syndrome working in the film industry? I do. I would say it takes like my work takes on so many different facets. Um, so when I work like on a set, with a crew like I definitely feel the imposter syndrome there um and it's been like trial by fire since day one because I basically walked onto my first shoot as a director which is so rare like that never it's very cool (laughs) but like but I had no like I didn't know what anyone's job was I I didn't have any experience doing any other role which I think is valuable experience like if you've been a PA and you've kind of got to see like observe how how people work on a set and how, how things run, um, and sort of been a, you know, a fly on the wall in a sense. I never had that experience that a lot Mm -hmm. of people have Mm -hmm. as a sort of prerequisite to directing. Um, so I was like, what am I doing? Where do I go? How do, how do I, I didn't even, I didn't know what an AD was. So I'm like, how do I get things done? Like what, who do I talk to? Like you an AD. Yeah. Basically are the bad guy for you. They go out and tell everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, that all very much was just like, okay, I guess we're figuring it out as we go along. And I, and I have, obviously there's still so much more that I am sure I need to learn, but, um, I would say that's the, that's the sort of environment where I feel the most like, I don't belong here. Yeah. What am I doing here? Yeah. Well, obviously Um, you do belong there because you're there. Yeah. So that's the thing with imposter syndrome. It's the people who feel it are usually the ones that deserve to be there. And the ones that don't deserve to be there are usually the ones that don't feel it. Yeah. That's (laughs) that's actually a very interesting observation. I'm curious how you continue to teach yourself or challenge yourself. You taught yourself everything about cameras and lighting and editing and rotoscoping. I don't know. You do everything. How the heck did you teach yourself? I think that my approach to everything has always been kind of a retroactive approach in the sense that I have a vision for what I want. I have no idea how I'm going to get from point A to point B. Um, So I sort of kind of like work backwards and I'm like, okay, this is what I want. This is the outcome. What are all of the tiny little pieces that I need to, of knowledge that I need to know in order to achieve this? Um, And so for that reason, my learning experience was very non-linear. Okay. it's not like I was like, you know, learning the basics of Adobe Premiere and then learning the, you know, this sort of intermediate knowledge, then transitioning to After Effects. I yeah. was like kind of in After Effects from day one. Okay. Um, Cause I was like, there's this thing that I want to yeah. do. I need to learn how to do it. I need After Effects to do it. So we're going for it. Um, and you just learned that through like YouTube tutorials? Yourself? Yeah. A lot of YouTube tutorials. I did have like one, um, <laughs> I got like a, uh, a credit at my university because the teachers all went on strike for like a month or something and we didn't have any class. So they gave us like a free class that we could take. So I took like one <laughs> little, like after it was very non, it was yeah unserious. Mm-hmm. Um, but that helped a little bit, but yeah, no, it was all just like, um, YouTube tutorials and, honestly just like a ton of trial and error yeah. just like shooting something five different ways and figuring out which way I like the most and then why do I like this the most yeah um yeah you did what everybody in the film industry recommends that new filmmakers do it's like just pick up the camera and start playing yes. around don't overthink it don't sign up for a bajillion courses or just go to film school like those things are all great but what you really need to do is just go, just go out there and try to make a movie yeah and see what happens yeah um, and and like obviously the the resources that we have are important like you you know I did have to do you know a lot of watching tutorials and reading things and but if you're not putting that knowledge into practice and you're not actually filming something yeah. there there is literally no way to actually comprehend that information without yeah doing it yourself it's a craft and I think that's that's like that's relevant in a lot of different industries it's just a craft you just have to get your hands dirty and that's <laughs> that's how you're gonna learn trial and error totally um, for sure so how did you decide like okay the first you know fork video <laughs> blows up mm-hmm. I'm sure you had like brands in your dms or like production companies or whatever how did you decide what your next move was like strategically on tiktok so I actually at the beginning for the first maybe like six to eight months like had no brands or any, like no one was coming to me for anything. I think that at that time, TikTok was still considered like not a real app. And like, this is is a trend. Like this is not going (laughs) to kind of sketchy. This is not going to last. Brands were not investing any money on TikTok at all. Um, So I actually, when I graduated, I got a job as 
a freelancer doing photo and video for um, oh. a brand. Mm -hmm. So they hired me um, to work on their content team after I graduated. So that was kind of like my first couple of months after graduation. Okay. Um, so social media was still very much like a, like a side, not even like a side hustle because I wasn't making like any money. Hobby. It was just like a hobby. Um, but something that I saw a lot of potential in and I definitely was never one of those people who was like, TikTok is stupid. Like I was like, yeah. no, TikTok is like going to be a thing. It's going to be a thing, yeah. Uh, it already is a we thing. It. So it wasn't until, um, so I, I started TikTok like March 2020. It wasn't until early 2021 that I really started getting um inquiries from brands Same. to make content yeah, early 2021 was when they started to be like oh this is where all gen z's are spending all their time mm -hmm. and i was like yeah and, and I, I and i wasn't like reaching out it wasn't like yeah. i was like hustling to get mm -hmm. like clients either like it was just kind of like again it was just like a very like chill like yeah I'm just making tiktoks for fun and whatever i love how you your strategy has been very simple a lot of people tend to clog up uh their audience with just like a membership merch youtube and like pushing them into a lot of different directions but you're like no i make these types of videos every single one of them is going to be really high quality you're very much quality over quantity which 100%. i love and you are you're signed with uh as a director and then you have your another agency that you're signed with yes right whaler did they approach you or did you approach them they approached me okay cool yeah. and i'm curious how you made the decision to sign with them as opposed to other people like how did how, like do you have mentors like how did you go about making all these really difficult decisions yeah I don't have mentors yeah. <laughs> my mom yeah seriously my mom like literally like thinks she's Kris Jenner and like she totally is like I love her Momager. for that Momager <laughs> um so with with the production company that I'm signed with as a commercial director that for me was a very easy decision because that was just like this is so cool how could you say um now? and and I, it didn't feel like something that was necessarily going to be an opportunity that I would get again. Yeah. Um, because not a lot of production companies are going to see potential in someone who's like a social media first yeah. creator, particularly like for the types of productions that they work on. For sure. Um, so that was just kind of like, okay, I have to do this. Um, the only thing that I like negotiated on that was the term of the contract because I was like a little scared. I was like, it was I don't long. Yeah, it was. I okay. think it might have been two years and I was like, mm, I don't know about that. Okay. Um, just because I was like, I, I have no idea what this even is. Yeah. Like, again, you, I love how you don't seem to overthink things. You think like you just try it out see how it goes. And then you yeah. abandon it if it doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, especially with a lot of these kinds of partnerships with um, like agencies and such. And not all of them, but a lot of them, it's like they don't really lose anything signing you. And I, I don't really lose much signing with them because it's just kind of like they're going to get me these commercial jobs that I probably couldn't get myself. Yeah. And um, I feel the same way about I didn't my say agency. that very eloquently, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like you theoretically could do all these things yourself and save that 10, 20 percent, whatever they're taking. But I don't want to. Yeah. Like, as you grow as a company, you need to invest in outsource things. And I don't like negotiating with brands and I mm. don't. It's not something I'm passionate about. Yeah. So why not just outsource that? Totally. And they were just like a totally different sector. Like, again, like it's more of the traditional commercial broadcast productions as opposed to. Yeah like the social media content. So it was like a totally different thing. Um, with my talent agency with mm -hmm. Whaler, that was a very like arduous decision for me okay. because I represented myself on that side of things. Yeah. I think for like two and a half years. Like for I your only, content creation, like partnering with whatever brand to make. Yes. Yeah, okay. I, rep I, I never had a manager because I had, I have such a low bandwidth. Like yeah. I make so few videos that I never had any problems getting work. Like I always had brands that were interested in working with me. And so it yeah. felt like, um, maybe I don't need someone to do that for me. Cause like what, what can yeah. they really do? Um, but Whaler is just such a, I mean, prestigious, like incredible mm -hmm. agency. So I was just honestly flattered and honored that they wanted to sign me. Yeah. I have a lot of creator friends who are signed with them that love working with them. Mm -hmm. And I was wrong in the end because mm -hmm. even though I do have such a low bandwidth, um, their, their negotiation is they have so much more leverage, so much more leverage. to negotiate you than make I so ever much would. More money. So it, it, yeah, it ended up being like a fabulous decision. <laughs> That's amazing. So it sounds like you've made lots of really good decisions along the way. So I'm curious about, your future goals <laughs> not to put you in the hot seat but you're already there what's your five-year plan five-year plan 50-year plan 80-year plan. oh man okay um my 
<laughs> my sort of immediate goals, and I mean, when I say immediate, I kind of see the next five years as is pretty immediate, to be honest, okay. um, is trying to help more people capitalize on what I'm doing. Because I've kind of noticed that I feel like there's a big gap in the market right now when it comes to video content for this kind of like higher quality content that could be used absolutely for digital ads and for e-commerce. And you kind of have like two opposite ends of the spectrum where you have people who create UGC and that obviously has a place, but UGC content um, tends to be very like organic feeling. It's shot mm -hmm. on an iPhone. Um, it's like, get ready with me yeah. or this is my product review. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have these like big production companies, glossy commercials, glossy yep. commercials, hundreds of thousands of dollars of budget. Yeah. And there is a little bit of a middle ground. Um, but I feel like there's no like real infrastructure for it where like a brand doesn't, if they want that middle ground, it's like, where do they go? Who do they talk to? Who do they contact? You, they Grace contact Wells. me, yeah. <laughs> but there's only one of me. There's only one. Um, so I'm trying to figure out like, how can I, build some sort of infrastructure Start that our own agency girl. yeah like that kind of a thing i don't know exactly like what Hire that me. looks like <laughs> let me work for you yeah literally. this is our job interview perfect this is excellent. also just a networking thing excellent um an agency sounds like a great network. yeah i would love to do like so, i don't know like i don't know exactly what it looks like but i would love to create some sort of again infrastructure where i can connect brands and creators because there are so many incredible creators who are filmmakers like yeah. um and not even necessarily every creator is a filmmaker in my true, mind true it's incredible what some of these kids absolutely are doing. absolutely and it just shows that when you give some, when you give an artist a tool they'll create art and it's so beautiful for me a little tangent out of the pandemic all of these people got bored people like me and you and when you give an artist space to create like look mm -hmm. at all this beauty that came out yes. what about like long term like do you want to keep directing commercials or you want to maybe build your own company. So here's the thing is like my entire life I've had a five year plan and it's never actually never. panned out the yeah. way that I thought it would, which is, which good. is good, which is, good. Yeah. Which is fine. Mm -hmm. But it, but it makes me realize that like you really can't plan in the way that you think that you can. I don't really know. That's I don't really know. I don't know what I'm doing, but Stay with the show. I know. <laughs> Um, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I would love to build a life for myself where I can have a little bit more of a work-life balance, which is not something that I have right now. Okay. And I think that sort of diversifying my business to not just be me making commercials, but it's me making commercials and I'm facilitating partnerships between other brands and, and I have this agency and like, I'm like, I would love to like do a couple of different things. Yeah. So it's not just like the same Every day. kind of work yes. all of the time. I feel you there. I love that so much. And I'm very, very excited for your future. And also I would like a job. So, um, if you could think about that, that'd be great. Um, I also, whatever you're offering, double it, triple it, <laughs> give me the company. Um, and I'm curious with your revenue, like from last year, for example, where, what was the split? Like, was it all from brand partnerships basically? Mm -hmm. Yeah. hundred percent. A hundred percent. Wow. Okay. So this year you did just launch a course. I did. Uh, and guys, I'm not talking about like, Oh, a course. Like she spent years. I spent, <laughs> spent like two and a half you years. You told me about this course two years ago uh -huh. that you were working on it. Uh huh. Like a lot of people do courses and they're like, but I'm not going to, I'm going to gatekeep the really good stuff, but you put it all out on the table. A hundred percent. Yeah. Which I love. Yeah. This has been such a passion project for me. And like, it's, it's something that, I mean, I'm, I'm like a perfectionist in everything I do and this is no different. Like yeah. I am so dedicated to providing as much value as humanly possible. And I know that you do that too in all mm -hmm. of your educational materials. Um, I think that there's, it's a really a shame that there's so, there's such a discourse online about like how online education yeah. is a not valid or B it's just like a cash grab or yeah. that kind of thing. Um, Which I think some there's, of it is. yeah, some of it yeah. absolutely is, but there's so um, much great stuff out there. But like, that was always my, my number one, like goal in making this is like, I want this to be the absolute best product I could ever possibly make and mm -hmm. just tell you everything that I've ever learned ever. Um, what's a piece of advice that you're happy you ignored? In the film space, both the kind of the traditional film space and the online film space, there's a lot of, there's like a culture of kind of telling people what they should and shouldn't be doing in the sense it's like, okay, you have to film with 
these specs and you have to use this transition and you have to do this, this, and this. Like there's kind of this like playbook of like what real filmmaking <laughs> is versus like what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and so I get a lot of people in my comment section all the time giving me like lots of advice about things, lots of unsolicited advice about things that I should or shouldn't be doing. It's like, I think she's um, okay guys. I think she's, she's doing okay. And I think that like what I've kind of learned, cause at the very beginning I was like, Oh shit, like I'm getting all this stuff wrong. Like I need to be shooting this way and not this way. And I think that what I've kind of learned is that like, um, as much as I, as much as I'm a rule follower, <laughs> when it comes to art for lack yeah. of a better word, like if you understand the rules and you understand why those rules are in place, yeah. then then you break them yeah. and you break them with intention and that's how you create art. And that's how you create yeah. art that has purpose and that's that's interesting for people. You know what I mean? So I think that that's kind of, yeah, my sort of like, I guess, MO kind of in the work that I do now is just ignoring, <laughs> ignoring a lot of the noise yeah. and understanding that I don't have to be doing things the way that everyone else do, does them. And that's why I've been able to build what I've built. Well, and you can even, you know, zoom out. And that's the thing with content creation in general. Most people in the world are critics and not creators. And you just need to remember that, like, it's easy to yell out, you know, critiques, especially from behind a keyboard anonymously. You know, the, the popcorn gallery can say anything they want but you're the one actually out in the arena making the stuff. Um, so yeah. yeah, I always keep that in mind. I'm yeah. like, if you, if you think you can do it better, please, yeah. you know, try. Yeah. But then again, you need to balance it with also listening to criticism and maybe somebody does have a really good suggestion. So totally for me, I'm always balancing that. And I've learned too that being defensive is not, yeah. is not constructive for anybody. Like it doesn't help them. It doesn't help you. Like you just, you take that, advice on <laughs> you either you know you either consider it or you don't so I like to finish out my episodes with co-authoring advice to somebody mm -hmm. so we have somebody wrote in um, oh wow really yeah this is a thing okay this is a thing and I thought this one was a great fit for you okay specifically because it's about changing careers okay so they said I'm a 28 year old software engineer living in Seattle working at a mid-sized but successful tech company I feel extremely bored and unfulfilled in my job and I'm becoming very burnt out all I do is sit at a desk and stare at screens my work isn't challenging or exciting and I am not passionate about it, but the pay and benefits are very good. My real passion is traveling, and I follow a bunch of travel content creators, and I think I could do it just as well, if not better than them. I've always been a hobbyist videographer and learning how to edit via YouTube tutorials in my spare time. On the weekends, I'm always traveling to national parks, biking, and hiking the trails. However, my current job provides so much financial stability, and my family is very proud of me. I don't know how they would react to me quitting to essentially become an influencer. I also have no clue how influencers actually make money or let alone buy a house or save for retirement. I'm so in the dark about the whole thing and have trouble finding resources that teach you how to actually make money creating content. I feel really stuck. I know that you can make a lot of money in content creation, but I also know that it's very competitive and I might not make any money at first. My initial thoughts are that it doesn't have to be an either or, at least not initially. I think that the kind of you know, responsible thing to do for lack of a better word is to kind of give yourself that grace or transition period where you're doing a little bit of both and testing the waters and trying things out. Yes. It's not necessarily, I'm going to quit my job tomorrow and yeah. go become an influencer. Mm -hmm. There can be more of like dipping your toes in and seeing how it feels and what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I did when I was transitioning from mm. being in nine to five corporate to being full-time freelances. I was kind of like, you know, I was taking my weekends, you know, it's, it's a, there's some sacrifices you have to make, but I would yeah. spend my weekends doing freelance work for clients, um, and yeah. just sort of building up a, a client base apart from my full-time job before actually making that jump. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's kind of important, especially if you're, you know, if you have that kind of financial stability, um, at your current position is to, not totally quick cold turkey, but, yeah. but just, but also allow yourself the space to explore other things. And I always say content creation will never become a job unless you treat it like one. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people out there that think that we just make videos and I'm like, there's so much more yeah. to mm -hmm. it than that. And I don't just mean like, it's, it's hard. It's not, it's not a hard job, you guys. Like it's, I hate when people say like, it's challenging in different ways, but this is by far the easiest job I've ever had um, after working on set and working in companies mm -hmm. and freelancing. Mm -hmm. But it is 
strategic and you don't have to be smart about yeah. the choices that you make. And that's why I was asking you about these choices that you make signing with this agency and how you manage your finances and just there's so much more that goes into it and it's thrown your way than you expect, which yes. is a good problem to have. Yes. Um, so yeah, I would say life is too short to be working in a job you hate. Yeah. Especially like being so young, like you have, yeah, there's so much more of your career left ahead of you yeah. and it would be such a shame to, to feel the way that you're feeling any longer. You yeah. Know? And it sounds like this person, I don't know if they're married or have kids, but like if you are unmarried and don't have kids, now is the time to take risks. Like yeah. even if you're married, like just b- maybe before kids, like yeah. that is the time in your twenties, maybe your thirties, like just like do as many things as physically possible. There's a great book by Meg Jay called The Defining Decade. And I recommend everybody in their 20s reads this book. Have you ever read it? No. It's really good. And she basically like the thesis of the book is just like, don't sit at home scrolling on your phone. Go out, like reach out to people, get an internship, get a job at a pharmacy, like just do anything. And you're going to learn more about yourself and more about the world. Um, And I think that's like the best advice. And I would say for this person as well I would recommend having an emergency fund Um, if they're working as a software engineer in Seattle they're probably making a pretty penny and can definitely make an emergency fund one more thing being a content creator is lucrative yes like there are so many parents out there who message me and are like my kid just wants to be a content creator and I'm like I get that because it is competitive and it is harder than I think a lot of people think it will be Um, however it's also a very very legitimate career Mm -hmm. I know many people who make more than surgeons lawyers doctors, engineers. So, and if you're in Seattle, like another interesting thing to consider is like, I know you want to be a travel content creator, but you don't necessarily have to go super far from Mm -hmm. Seattle to make that kind of content. And even if it's, if you're like, Oh, I don't have time to just like run away on the weekend and go like to make some travel content across the country, like just do it in your own backyard. Cause there's so many amazing things in that area that you can talk about and places you can visit and things you can do. Absolutely. And I'd also recommend reaching out to your favorite travel creators. That's another thing is like, I don't see anybody as competition. I'm like friendly with everybody and I just try to learn and be inspired by other yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, percent so, oh my gosh, I'm, do you have any copycats? Do you have anybody who tries to do what you do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, doesn't, like, I feel like, yeah, everyone kind of, I have a lot of grace for people who copy me. There's two different sides to this coin. If someone who is already, like, really doing very well on social media copies me, that kind of rubs me the wrong way because I'm like, okay, like, you you kind of know, you kind of have your thing, yeah. you know what you're doing, you're you're doing well, you don't need to copy me. Yeah. But if it's someone who's, like, just starting out and they're really inspired by what I'm doing and they just bought their camera and, like, they're yeah. making content like me because they, they really love my content, then I'm like, okay, cool, like, go yeah, for it. that's cute. Because um, yeah. that's, like, like, what I did when I first started out, too, is, like, when I first bought a camera, I didn't know what I was doing, so I was replicating what I saw. And yeah. I think that's very natural, and I think that over time you find your own creative voice and your own... Um, your own stories that you want to share and that you want to communicate and then you don't need to be doing that anymore. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very much all for people experimenting and, yeah. and creating content that's similar to mine. So thank you so much for coming in. I think that's all my questions. Is there anything thank else you for that you having would like? me. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would like to tell people who are maybe interested in pursuing a career in content creation or video production? Um, maybe just some like words of, of wisdom for them. I think that one of the one of the things that's helped me the most I feel to get to where I am has just been to constantly like listen to my impulses and like follow my like follow my compulsions for lack of a better word. I think that all the time like if you're a creative person you get kind of get struck with these like creative ideas and it's easy to convince yourself that like they're not good ideas yeah. like the crumb thing. Yeah. Um but then once you actually try it out and execute it it can be like actually a really awesome video or a really awesome yeah. piece of content. Yeah. Um so I think it's a lot of it is just about trusting yourself and following your intuition and recognizing that just because someone else hasn't done it before doesn't mean it's not a good idea. In fact, that might make it a better idea. Yeah. Well, Grace, this was a fantastic conversation. I'm sure the listeners and the viewers got much value out of this. I can't believe that you're only 26 and you're already just killing it. Um, and I'm Thanks, Erin. Very excited that you're in New York <laughs> and that we can hang out more. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. This was fun. 